Can you meet him? Is he working? Yep. Good. Uh, thank you, Shane, for that lovely, warm welcome. And hello, everyone. I do also want to acknowledge that we are meeting on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respect to their elders past and present, and I also pay my respect to Aboriginal people who are present here today. Uh, like Shane, I too was uh, very uh, humbled and uh, overwhelmed to know that I was going to be in the company of such a wonderful group of people who are here today representing uh, government, uh, not-for-profit, the educational uh, sector, uh, non-government uh, and education settings, as well as uh, former and current members of parliament. And so I'm delighted to be here today to share with you some brief thought or reflection on uh, the Disability Discrimination Act uh, 25 years ago. Have we, how far have we come and how much more do we need to, uh, to go? <coughs> and again, I also want to acknowledge uh, many familiar faces here and I want to say thank you for the work that you do. And I think also the work that the Affinity Intercultural Foundation does is critical in just remembering that we are all humans at the end of the day. We all have feelings, we all want to be respected, we all want to belong, we all, all want to be part of the community. So the work you do is critical to a harmonious and peaceful society. And sadly, however, people with disabilities are still excluded from nearly everyday activity. Shane articulated quite poignantly the fact that if he was not able to get up into this uh, room, what would, what would have happened? You wouldn't see Shane, but I did suggest to Shane prior to uh, coming up here, uh, coming up into the room, that we would have to go, uh, we would go out into the street. I'm sure Affinity staff will quite easily um, mobilise and off we go down to the street. So it's about making sure that we are including, never excluding. And that's the challenge that we have in Australia today, is to every day think about a small but very powerful act of inclusion but also exclusion. I also want to say that this week is a very busy week for the disability sector. We have International Day of People with Disability, disability coming up on Sunday, Sunday the 3rd of December. I described it the other day as disability Christmas. And then I thought, mm, yes, yeah, it's Christmas in the sense that we are coming together to celebrate, but also a reminder of the importance of continuing to create a society that is inclusive. And that's what Christmas is also about. Christmas is important to many religions. A time to come together, a time to reflect on the year, share good food, share good company, and sadly that is something that people with disabilities miss out on nearly every day. So, in 1992, now it's not a trick question, but 1992 is when the Disability Discrimination Act was assented to. For those of you familiar with the parliamentary processes, it was assented to by the Parliament and by the Governor General. But it actually came into operation, or the substantive uh, part of the, the Act came into operation on the 1st of March 1993. So this coming March will be the actual 25th anniversary of when people with disabilities were able to use the law to uh, challenge <coughs> acts of discrimination. And I'm based at the Australian Human Rights Commission and we will be marking the anniversary with a number of events and I encourage you to, to also consider marking it as a way of a reminder that the conversation do need to keep happening. So in 1992, 1993, people with, with disabilities were promised a federal law that would ensure or would promise in them that there would be no discrimination, that they would be able to participate in education, employment, use banking facility, uh, go to clubs and association, uh, participate in community activity. And I must qualify by saying that I was quite young when the Disability Discrimination Act came into operation. 
I do remember very vividly starting at university and there was no federal legislation. By the time I finished university, there was. So you can probably work out how old I am. And let me illustrate the difference in pre and post DDA, we say DDA. I started university and I asked for note taking for support in my lecture because I knew I would not be able to hear or follow the lecture. And I went to the disability support office and I asked them to provide me, or could they uh, arrange for rather, arrange uh, note taking. And the response was, mm, we can't do that. We'll give you a tape recorder. You can take the lecture, take them home, and maybe your mum could listen to them and then <laughs> fill out and do the note. So that was a common theme every year for the first four years. And I think what sparked my desire to do something about it was I saw a young woman who had also been to my school, primary school, a secondary school, she was deaf and she was about to start law school and I did not want her to go through the same experience. And of course, the DDA had been in operation for one or two years. So armed with the law, a federal law, and armed with experience of knowing that I don't want others to have to experience what I have, who are able to get note-takers for, well, for, for my final year of law school and for <coughs> her first year and she had them right through her university. My marks went up to the roof in my final year, but I have to also qualify that by saying I did spend a bit of time in the university bars, I'm in student mm -hmm. politics, I was socialising a lot, so maybe that could have also impacted my marks throughout my university career. That is just one example of discrimination that people experience even today. How far have we really come? One way of, of reflecting on this is to look at the complaints that have come through the Dis Disability Discrimination Act. So the Human Rights Commission run a complaint handling service where people with disability can make a complaint that they feel they have been discriminated against. And since 1992-1993, they've heard over 15,000 complaints about disability discrimination alone. For the last five years, disability discrimination complaints have made up the most of the complaints that we receive at the Commission. A uh, dis disability, a rape, sex discrimination and board human rights uh, discrimination. So for the last five years, the percentage has hovered around 38 to 40 percent of total complaints have been about disability discrimination. And why? We don't really know why, but we do know, other than obviously there's still a lot of discrimination happening, but the numbers have been also around educating people about their rights. So the more you know about the rights, the more you can do something about it. But also, in the last five years, we've had the National Disability Insurance Scheme, and I know there are some colleagues, I think, here from the NDIS, and hello to you. The NDIS, I think, has elevated the discord or rather the conversation around disability into the mainstream society. So we are hearing about disability more. So I think that's also resulted in more complaints coming to the Commission. I won't bore you with the technicalities of discrimination or disability discrimination. It's just to say two things. Firstly, we talk about direct discrimination where a person is obviously being discriminated against because of their disability, where someone might say, I'm not employing you because you have a disability. The other kind of dis discrimination is indirect, where it may not be intentional, but something does result in uh, a person with a disability being discriminated against. And a common example we use is, if there is a fire in this building, everyone must use the stairs. Now, I'm not going to, uh, you know, obviously put change to a corner, but change what would happen to you if there was a fire, could change comply with the requirement to use stairs. So that's just a way of looking at how we've got many things in life. With, I know the intention is not always a negative one, but it does inadvertently uh, end up discriminating against people with disability. <coughs> so with the complaints, We've also seen in the last five years, most of the complaints are around, well, the top two areas of complaints are around employment. People want to work. 
people with disability can and should be able to work, but we see a lot of discrimination in the workplace or in trying to actually get a job. And then the other area is access to good and servitude. So banking facility, uh, going to the movies, no caption to get people, trying to uh, use an online um, web a website and it's not accessible to people who are blind and so forth. But they're the top two complaints, not uh, far behind uh, education and access to government services. So for example, not being able to access Centrelink or another um, form of pension and it's being discriminatory, discriminatory for people with disability. It's not all doom and gloom. Uh, there have been some amazing uh, uh, outcome in the last 25 years. Uh, among them are uh, the, the NDIF, the National Disability Insurance Scheme. I commend the Gillard government for recognising that the time had come, or the time had passed for another inquiry, for another review, for another um, pilot. Let's get on with it. We know it won't be perfect when we start, but let's get the NDIS established, and then we work towards a system that should be able to fulfil the aim of supporting people live independently. I remember in 2013 when the NDIS bill was going through Parliament and it was coming towards the election and clearly the Gillard government wanted to get this done and there was a lot of what we would call naysayers in the community saying again, oh we're not quite ready for this, oh we probably need to do another pilot uh, or maybe even more research. And there was a letter in the Sydney Morning Herald, a short one from I can't remember where she or she was from, and it's quite simply said, what is the rush? Let's just wait. And I remember I had my coffee, and I think I just spluttered, because this was just a small, but frustrating example of, oh, let's just wait. People with disability have been abused, neglected, and sadly even killed by their carers for hundreds and even thousands of years. At what point are we ever going to be ready? And I've reflected in the last year or so about the Medicare. Medicare was not perfect when it was uh, established, and whether it was perfect now is another uh, matter for another day. <laughs> Medicare was introduced by the Labor government, it was taken away by the uh, Liberal government, and then when Labor came back in, they reintroduced it. So you can see, if I was to suggest to all of you or to the community, shall we get rid of Medicare? You can imagine the outbreak. We've become accustomed and new to the fact that we should have a good, high quality medical system in Australia. And that is my aim and ambition for the NDIS. Yeah. In 25 years from now, the NDIS will be part of the social fabric like anything else that we take for <coughs> granted. But that's a great thing. And as I said earlier, it also elevated the conversation around disability. So I call upon you to support the NDIS and remember it's about making sure that people with disability can get out of their home, can have showers, get the right support and out and about into the community. Other great things that have happened, uh, my predecessor, Graham Hinnett, took on rail court. He would get the train and he still does get the train daily from his home up on the North Shore to his town. Graham just simply wants to know which station has he arrived at. And by trying to get City Rail and the Department of Transport to understand the simplicity of having not only uh, a, a written or written announcement, but also a verbal or audio announcement, central, you're arriving at Redfern. Now that's not a difficult concept, but Graham had a lot of challenges in trying to get City Rail to understand that. So Graham put his uh, financial situation at risk and took on that matter and we now have audio announcement as well as the visual uh, announcement for which station you are arriving at. Another one of my colleagues, Julia Harrickson, uh, who's now retired and lives up in the North Coast, she took on Murray's bus company. She wants to be able to go to Canberra because as we know there are no trains between Sydney and Canberra, so the only option for people who use wheelchairs are buses. So she was successful in getting Murray to introduce, over time, progressively accessible buses. 
and Bruce McGuire, another name that's known in the disability sector, a blind man who wanted to be able to register for the event and other things relating to the Sydney 2000 Olympic. The website is not accessible. So he took on, as we know, Stockhog, the Sydney Organising Committee of the Olympic Games, and was successful in ensuring that their website would be successful, um, would be accessible, but also since then, there's been a greater awareness of making sure that we know you need to have an accessible <coughs> website. And the list goes on. And it's also important to think about what does that mean daily? And Shane mentioned, you know, the lift. He got stuck in the lift. No accessible toilet. And this is the reality of every day for people with disability. And the thing that I'd like you to think about is the thing that you take for granted every day, coming to an event like this, going shopping, going to the movies with your family, sending your child to the local primary school, as opposed to people who are deaf not being able to go to the latest movie because they're not captioned. People or families who have a young child with a disability who can't enroll their child in the local school with the principal sees no need or no room for that child to be included in the, in the classroom, or as I've sadly seen other parents saying to the principal, we don't want that kind of child or that type of child with my children. These are stories that I hear every day. So that leads me to what am I doing uh, about this? There's only one of me. Uh, I have a fantastic telemetry back the commission, uh, small but fantastic. And what I've done in the last year is, as Shane noted, there was a gap of full-time commissioner. Uh, Graham, in the Graham in the term in 2014, they, the government did not reappoint a full-time commissioner. So they asked Sue Devine, who was then the age discrimination commissioner, to take on the disability portfolio. And she did that, and I commend her for the work that she did, including undertaking, you know, last year, up until May last year, a major inquiry into workplace issues or discrimination for older Australians and people with a disability. I thought it was important when I started well, to just to go around Australia and listen very carefully to what are still the major issues. And I'm, I'm familiar with the issues given my background, but I also thought it was important to. Listen, so I went all around Australia, and as you can imagine, the NDIS was a very hot topic of discussion because it's you know, now four years into implementation and we are now starting to see some of the emerging issues. But people also told me they want to be able to work, they want to be able to get an education, they want to be able to live in the community with their family and friends in accommodation that suits their needs. They want to live a life free of violence. They don't want to be overrepresented in the criminal justice system. And so these are the areas that I've developed as my priority. Education, employment, housing, criminal justice system, the issue of violence against people with disability, and number six is the NDIA. Obviously, there's so many other things to think about. Access to uh, transport, access to health, access to community services, and access to uh, goods and services. So I will also monitor those in my term. I've been given a five-year term, and if the last year with anything to go by, there's a lot more to be done, and the time is, is ticking on. So that is my mandate is to also make sure that when we talk about people with disabilities, we talk about them in a respectful way, we don't exclude them. That's where the media plays an incredibly important role, is to ensure that the portrayal of people with disabilities is uh, in a positive and respectful way. And in closing, I want to leave you with uh, some, see, just how far have we come? For too long, people with disabilities have been left out of decision making about the things that affect their lives. Last year, for the first time ever, a person with an intellectual disability was elected to the International Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So, 
the International Committee, uh, also led by the United Nations, had a committee that looked at the convention that we have here in Australia, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. Last year, Robert Martin, who is a man with intellectual disability from New Zealand, was elected, and he spoke very powerfully about the need to make sure that it's not just about people here in this room, it's about the people that we don't see every day. It's about people who are being neglected, it's about people who are having acts of violence perpetrated against them. We always need to keep that in mind. The visibility, or rather the invisibility of people with disability needs to be addressed. I'm very excited about the future. I have seen in my short time how far we can come individually as well as working together collectively. I think it's incredibly important that the government continue to, to, to commit to the National Disability Insurance Scheme. There will be and have been TV implementation issues. We also need to ensure that the organisations that support people with disability have ongoing well, funding and support. Because this is a really critical time in the history of people with disability in Australia. The NDIS is about creating independence, but also it, a whole new world. People with disabilities have never had the true independence before. So it means that they also need to have the right support to then be able to enforce their rights. So in closing, I want to say thank you again very much to the Affinity Intercultural uh, Foundation for hosting me so warmly, and also to all of you, in particular those who do such great work in the disability sector, and thank you so much.